for making the time to be here. We thank you. Uh, all the kids who are in the house, we love you. We are so grateful. Let's, let's hear it for the children as well. It's so, so good. Uh, thank you, Pastor Mogisha and Pastor Mishu. Uh, you guys are just hilarious. And, you know, I'm so grateful that we have brothers, sisters, sons, daughters in different parts of the world. I mean, in my wildest dreams, I would never have thought that I'd be in a place where I have a son and a daughter, and a son, sons and daughters, because both of those men are my sons in the Lord, and their wives are my daughters, and we love them very much. And so it's such a joy to just know you guys. And they lead amazing congregations, by the way. Uh, don't, don't, I mean, I wish, like when you're next traveling, in fact, don't say when you're next traveling, make a plan to travel and go to Kigali, go to uh, Bujumbura, because God is doing some amazing things through those congregations. So, I mean, don't just look at them. I mean, they're all comedians and all that, but let me tell you, these are serious generals in the kingdom. And God is using them to do amazing. They're leading, by the way, they lead incredible congregations. Uh, the people in those churches are just smart, amazing people. And it's such a joy to host you. I'm glad you're here. And all, of, all those of you who are watching on the watch parties as well, let's appreciate uh, the different diaspora campuses. We love you guys. Let me, you know what? Every Mavuno church is special. Like, I've never gone to a Mavuno church and thought how ordinary these people are. I'm always in awe at the kind of people that God has chosen to raise. Uh, just amazing, amazing people. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do through all of us. How are you doing this morning? Wow, are you glad to be here? Yeah, 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 I can see. And I can see all the different colors. I can see everybody's looking nice and, and colorful. And come on, I'm representing Lifeway today. But yesterday I was in a different color. I was in white. So I'm, I'm a father who tries to be politically correct. But today, unfortunately, I chose everything representing one particular network, <laughs> the Sky Network, I hear. The blood, is still red. the blood is still red inside. That's true. That's true. And the eyes are white. <laughs> and the skumariki is green, huh? the one I ate, so don't worry, I'm there. And yellow is the color of my house, by the way. Uh, everything in my house is yellow. So, so I, to now penda nyote, to now lombotov. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. My goodness, it's so good to be here. God is so amazing. It's so, so great. And you know what? We had an amazing time yesterday, didn't we? Uh, as somebody said, hearing that even fathers struggle to be fathers. It's not just children who struggle to be children. Fathers struggle to be fathers. So for those of you who are joining us, uh, we've had an amazing time so far. Uh, God's been doing some incredible heavy lifting. Uh, we've seen sons and daughters coming back home. We've seen prodigals coming back and owning their home and running back home. It's been an amazing time. We've seen God healing people, releasing uh, fatherhood and daughterhood, I mean, and, 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 and motherhood on people, uh, sons and daughters receiving that. It's just been an amazing time. You know, there's a guy who told us, one of the testimonies in the first day, uh, if you guys remember, there's a guy who actually said, and we're still trying to figure out how that happened, because he said, my wife and I went home discussing this the whole way in the car, because he said, remember the guy who, I don't know if he's here, um, is he here? Kogola, is he here? I don't know if he's here, but he said that he had not been in Mavuno for 11 years, and he was just passing outside. He had moved to the neighborhood, didn't even know that there was a Mavuno here, and he was passing outside the gate, so jogging outside the gate, saw the sign Mavuno, asked people what's going on today, and somebody told him, sons are coming back home. <laughs> like, like, I know that was not a Mavunite, because Mavunites don't say that. <laughs> like, that is such an unMavuno thing to say. And the guy came home, and he found home, he found the church he had abandoned many years ago, and he's like, I'm back home. And I was like, we went home saying, that must have been an angel. Because I'm sure, Geneva you're, you're, Geneva, you're not the one who said, artisans are coming back home. That was not our theme. It was not the thing we we're talking about. And I said, there must be angels all around bringing sons and daughters back home. And I really believe this is a season when the hearts of the fathers will be reunited to the sons and the hearts of the sons to their fathers. And God will lift the curse and bring the blessing. So this is what we've been talking about. Let me just catch you up for those who are away. We talked about the blessing of sonhood. Papa Kilo, he's the one who brought that word to us. 
uh, Pastor Kevin Kilonzi, talk, talk to us about the fact that your, life, your lifetime is too short for you to work for the blessings you need in it. God has called you to a call that is too big for you, that if you could get all the equipping, by the time you get it, you'll be dead. So God brings fathers into your life to give you the gift you need to be able to achieve the purpose you need to. And that's what spiritual fathers uh, do in your life. You need to inherit some things. Then we talked about the fact that fathers lift the curse and release blessing. That's the role of fathers. The world is already operating under a curse. And so what God does is he allows a vessel he calls father to be the one that has the power to bless. And that power is to lift the curse that we're already operating under so that we can move with ease and acceleration. That's the role of fathers. We talked about the fact that family is very key if we want to form global discipleship movements. That you cannot have global discipleship movements without family. Uh, without family, you just remain a traditional church. You're stuck in one place. When you become a family, you're able to release and go across the world and become what Jesus wanted us to become. Uh, people who are able to go out to every corner of the world and make disciples of all nations. We talked about the fact that there was something about Jesus that gave him authority. He knew his identity. And we talked about the fact that if you don't know your identity as a son or a daughter, then you will not have the authority you need. Jesus had a lot of authority, but it came from knowing his identity. Ask your neighbor, do you know your identity? Yeah, this is, this is it. You need to know your identity. You need to know the identity of your family so that you know what it is you've inherited to call out in your disciples. Because if you don't, people are going to follow you and you're just going to lose them. But when you understand what you have, you're able to say like, Jesus, follow me and I will make you. Yeah, you, because you have authority. And many times when you don't have authority, we're not able to lead strongly. We talked about the fact that, oh my goodness, you must know your commander's intent. This one was by a military uh, man who came and taught us how the military worked. That one was worth the money I paid to come. <laughs> that was worth the price of admission, isn't it? I mean, like, just listening to Major Boke talk about the military, I think it changed, it re rewired our minds. We stopped joking with this thing of saying we're an army, and we began to understand what kind of thinking armies have. And one of the key things is that armies understand the intent of their commander. And he talked about how do we begin to understand our leader's intent so that, that becomes a thing that directs us. And then we talked about the fact that we must teach obedience. It must, it's the hardest thing. People don't like following, but we must teach them because we save their lives. If you don't teach your children to be obedient, you're killing them. If you don't teach your children in life to obey, you're destroying their lives. You hate your children if you do that to them. And it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. If you don't teach the people God gives you as disciples to obey, then you're basically hating them. You're destroying their lives. And there are many Christians who are walking around destroyed because nobody taught them that we're here to obey. And then we talked about our battle formations. We talked about the fact that all this that we're talking about actually falls into who we are as Mavuno Church. The role of the discipleship group, the central role of the discipleship groups. And talked about the fact that with each of these, uh, whether it's uh, the missional community, the zones, the campuses, the networks. Uh, we talked about all those things, the movement. And then there's, a, there's one that I'm still trying to name, and Pastor Kilonzi called it tribes uh, when we were talking yesterday. I don't know what it is, but we say that, you know what, we are going to get to a place where we stop being one movement and we're already getting there. The time has come. When we stop being even just one movement and we become a movement with movements. And we talked about the fact that we don't know whether we're going to call them tribes, we don't know what we're going to call them, but there's a time that God is leading us into when we become a movement of movements. And it's already happening. And then we talked about, we had this conversation. We kept it real. We had the keeping it real conversation. And uh, we heard from our generals and some of the challenges they've struggled when it comes to following. And then we had a chance when we just had an open house and a conversation and different ones of you shared. Wasn't that amazing? I really enjoyed that last session. It was so fascinating. I can't wait to even go back and listen to it again uh, afterwards. By the way, all these are going to be online on YouTube. So I want to encourage you, by the way, don't just come and listen once. Uh, make it a habit. Take, take the talks. You can watch them again on YouTube. Uh, I, I, put, I always put them on my podcast, so you can get them on that podcast and listen to them if you're one of those audio people. And, and you know what? It's just a way that you begin to engage. One of the best ways to follow, by the way, is to listen. And to listen over and over and over. Because the more you listen, the more it begins to inform your understanding of your commander's intent. You begin to hear what is God saying? Because sometimes you hear the surface 
and you think that's enough. But when you reflect, the Bible calls that meditation. When you meditate on the word that was taught, something begins to shift. And so I want to challenge you to take this and listen to it again and just see what new insights uh, God brings uh, to you. Now, today, I, as I prayed, by the way, when I left here last night, I had no clue what I was going to talk about today. And um, I woke up at 2 this morning. I said, okay, God, tell me what to say because I don't have a word. Uh, I don't know how you want me to end this. And God told me, lift up your eyes. Help your people lift up their eyes. Help them understand why. Why do we follow? You know, we've talked about all the practicals. Do this, do this, do this. But sometimes you need to move away from the ground level and go up to 30,000 feet and understand the bigger picture. Why is it so critical that we begin to understand this? Why are we even talking about this? Why is God leading us in this direction? And so today I want to talk a bit about the message, the big picture of why we're doing this whole shift. And I think it's so important that we understand the mission and its objective. Many people are surprised when they hear that the focus of Jesus' teaching was not salvation. Jesus did not come just for salvation. It's not the focus. Jesus said you must be born again one time. You'd never know that because when you hear us talk as pastors, you might think that's all he talked about. But Jesus only talked about that one time. The main thing that Jesus talked about was the kingdom of God. That was his recurrent message. He talked about it over and over and over. Right from the beginning of his ministry, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15, it tells us right from the start, right from the beginning, it says, after John was put in prison... Jesus went into Galilee, and this is the beginning of his ministry, proclaiming the good news of God. Now, if you read this, uh, oh, yeah, let's go to the next verse. He says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus would talk about the kingdom of God. And there was a response he wanted because he said, the kingdom of God is now here. Because I'm here. The kingdom of God has come, and there's something that you must do to respond to this kingdom. The gospel, this good, the gospel of the kingdom is really, gospel means good news. So he's basically saying, there's a good news, there's some good news that I'm here to tell you. The purpose I'm here on earth is to tell you the good news. And what is the good news? That the kingdom of God is now here. That was his one message. I could read for you many, many. By the way, look at, try and read the Gospels now with that perspective and ask, what did Jesus talk about? As we're going through the New Testament reading, ask yourself, what did Jesus talk about? You'll be shocked. Almost everywhere, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God looks like this. This is how the kingdom of heaven looks like. And he's introducing a concept called the kingdom of God. Now, because we live in democracies, we live in modern days, Many of us have forgotten how kingdoms operated. Many of us have never been part of a kingdom. I think our Ugandan friends, many of them know what kingdoms are because of Uganda has kingdoms. Nigeria has kingdoms. Yeah? Ghana has kingdoms. But in Kenya, we really don't have any functional or operational kingdoms. So when we hear the word kingdom, we don't even understand what is a kingdom. You know, it's interesting, our parents, however, they understood very well in Kenya what a kingdom was. Uh, if your parents went to school in colonial times, like mine did, they sang a very queer song. And the words of the song were, God save our gracious queen, long live our noble queen, God save the queen. Send her victorious, happy and glorious, Born to rule over us, God save the queen. And our parents would wave little flags. Those parents who went to school those days, they would wave little British flags as they would sing this in their parade. Even as they sang, there's even another stranger song. It's called Rule Britannia. I mean, you can actually Google some of this stuff. And it said, Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Britons never, never shall be slaves. Little African children singing that. Though in the process of being colonized into a kingdom. That was what was happening. They were being taught to be subjects of a kingdom. 
a kingdom whose culture was completely different than theirs. Because you see, kingdom takeover is never a gentle affair. Wow. It's never a gentle affair. When Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is now here. The people of his day, they knew how kingdoms operated. And they knew when a kingdom takes over, it's not a gentle affair. This is why the people were threatened by him. This is why the Jews said, we must let the Romans kill him. We must accuse him of standing against the kingdom of Caesar. Because they understood, you can't have two kingdoms in one space. A kingdom means the domain of a king. So I cannot be here in a domain of a king, and then you come and stand here and you say, this is another kingdom. Already that is treason. There can only be one kingdom in one place at a time. And Jesus is saying what? The kingdom of God is now here. Come on, somebody. You know, it's interesting because even till today, the Kenyans, um, you may laugh or be shocked at your parents and how colonized they were. But let me ask a question. How many of you have ever worn a suit or a skirt suit to work, even when it's really hot? Come on, let me just see, show of hands. Maybe even with a tie. I'm just showing you evidence of colonization, isn't it? How many of you speak English better than your mother tongue? Yeah, just look around the room. Rule Britannia. Britannia is in the house. Yeah, we even call it Queen's English. And some of us are so proud of speaking it. We don't, we're not as proud of speaking our own language. But we are proud until we correct other people when they don't speak the Queen's English. We are still representing God save the Queen. This colonization thing is serious, I'm telling you. It's a big thing. And I mean, this one, you don't even have to put up your hands. How many of you have ever driven on the left side of the road? Yeah. Yeah. That's, those are the evidences and the artifacts of colonization. That is kingdom. There was a kingdom that was of another place that had taken over the minds and the thinking of the people of this part of the world. What is the definition of a kingdom? A kingdom is a country, a state, or territory that is ruled by a king or a queen. And this word, like I said, it comes from the word king and domain the realm or domain over which a king has authority so let's talk a bit about kings i want to tell you a few things about kings that you who vote in presidents have no clue about uh, because kings and queens are very different from presidents number one a king is never voted out of power a king is never voted out of power kingship is by right and not by appointment kings are born as kings and already even in england they know who the next king is going to be there's not going to be a lottery in the family to decide who the next king is. From the moment he was born or she was born, it was clear that this is the next monarch of this country. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> Kings are not voted out. You know, the people in the Bible, they understood who a king is. Because read Psalm 115 verse 3. It says, our God is in heaven and he does what pleases him. There's no elections in heaven. Yeah. There's no campaigning. <laughs> There's no campaigning in heaven. When one of the archangels, one of the three most powerful angels, decided to oppose the king, he was kicked out. Pastor James today read a very interesting scripture that was part of our Matthew readings about these people who refused to attend the king's invitation party. Did you, did you catch what happened to them? The king sent an army to destroy them. Wow. Like, I don't call you to my party and you refuse to come. He sent his army and he... Dis you know, sometimes we read the scripture like we know what we are reading. We don't actually open our eyes. Like, who does that? Pastor Madrid, we're having a bash with Pastor Carol. So you and Pastor James, you're, you're invited. Ah, we can't come. We just got married. We are on honeymoon. <laughs> what a shock. The next thing that happens to you is you're finished. You don't tell a king no. Because a king has total authority. And that's the next point. A king's authority is absolute. He never needs to consult. His word is law. And if you read Psalms 19 verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. <laughs> You're not being told to debate the law. You've just been told what it is. 
It is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The king's law is perfect. It's the last word. There's no debate when it's given. You, you, that is the law. That is the law of the land. A king owns everything within his domain. In places where there was a king, there was no ownership of land apart from the king. All land was king's land. And by the way, when you find what we call leasehold titles in Kenya, those, those, are, from the, those are colonial artifacts. Because what happened is they then said all land that is leasehold, that is all the land in Nairobi especially, belongs to the government. And the government is the one that gives you permission to use it. That actually comes from the monarchy. Because that's not how our ancestors lived. But this is an imposed system. That you, the government gives you permission to use the land for 99 years. But that's what happens in monarchies. All the land belongs to the king. All the possessions are the king. And he allows his friends and those who are close to him to be the ones to administer on his behalf. And that's what happens. Psalm 24 verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is when you read the Bible, the people who come from a monarchy, they understand it differently from you. People who've been ruled by a king, they understand what that means. For us, it's like the earth is the Lord's and, he, and I suggest to him how my life should be run. <laughs> Somebody in a monarchy knows, no, 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 no. The earth is actually his. The money you have is borrowed money. He has allowed you his resources so that you can be a steward with them. Remember the story of the servants who are given money and the master goes away, but he leaves them his resources. When he comes back, he expects an accounting. And I usually teach this when I teach about money. All money is God's. Your job is God's. And God will expect an accounting for the things he gave you because he's going to ask, what did you do for my kingdom with the resource I put in your hand? And many times we're like, oh God, I'm too busy with my job. Pastor James, you know, I can't serve nowadays. I've been promoted. You know, people like me, we're always, I have to go to Bodhaiga because that's where the bosses are. We play golf on Sunday morning. What a shock. It's because you don't understand what a king is. And the fact that everything is his. Like, remember, I'm telling you, the reason I'm showing this to you is because we don't understand it, so we don't live it out. We don't understand. One day there will be an accounting and God will ask you, what did you do with those children I gave you? What did you do with that money I gave you? What did you do with that car I gave you? Did you use it for the king's business? And because we don't understand it, we think that that's something that we have rights to. Number four, a king confers citizenship. A king confers citizenship. Democracies, we choose leaders. The citizens confer kingship <laughs> or leadership in a democracy. But in a kingship, it is the king who decides who the citizens are. The king has the right to strike somebody off the role of citizenship. Back in the day when there were kings, you could be exiled and you are no longer a citizen. You're a citizen of no land because the king said so. The king could find somebody who was a worthy foreigner from another country and give them the rights to become a king, uh, to become a, a person in that family. And John chapter 1, uh, John chapter 15 verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so you may go and bear fruit. The king is giving citizenship. Other, other scripture talks about the fact that you are citizens of heaven. That God has chosen to make you citizens of his kingdom. Again, sometimes we have to wrap our minds around that because we've not been taught to think like this. But the nature of ultimate reality is that heaven is not a democracy, it's a monarchy. The, the governments we, ha we are under today, they don't represent what heaven looks like. See, because we don't know that, we sometimes think we can argue things. Wow. We sometimes think, I'm done with God. It's like, how dare he? Wow. Like, I don't know, I'm just taking, me and Jesus, we are on, on a break. yeah, on a break. I'm on a break right now. I gave God two weeks. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving God two weeks, <laughs> figure out what he wants, you know? It's like we think that we have that because we grew up in democracies where we vote leaders. A leader is not good. We're just waiting for the next election. We kick him out of office. And we don't understand that's not the nature of ultimate reality. Number five, a king can delegate authority to anyone he pleases. The king could decide this is now your land. This is now your responsibility. And that person, that was their responsibility. Remember Nehemiah. 
when he went to the king, he was a servant, he was, he was a cup bearer. He was basically a, 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 a bodyguard to the king. And he said to the king, my home is in, is in ruins. And the king who, was, who really liked this servant of his made him a governor. Like right there. He was like, here are the keys. Here are the resources. Go and build that country. You're now the governor. That's what kings did. They didn't have elections. They didn't have to go to parliament to get their candidate vetted. Wow. Basically, when the king said, this is the one in charge, that was the one in charge. Matthew 18, verse 18. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound on earth. Whatever you bind in heaven will be, uh, whatever you loose on earth will be, uh, you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's an authority that a king is giving at that point. And he's saying, I give you these keys. He said to Peter, I give you these keys. He said that to his disciples. Whatever you bind, there, it's as good as done in heaven. And so when Nehemiah showed up, he showed up with the full authority of the Persian Empire to rebuild the wall. And nobody could with, with, uh, withstand against him because if you stand against him, you're standing against the king. Now, obviously, this is a kind of unchecked power that makes us nervous. We people who live in democracies, we get nervous with this kind of power. Because we're like, hey, but what if he's corrupt? What if he tells us to do things that are bad for us? This is what democracies exist for. So if a king is corrupt, you kick him out after 10 years. What if he, what if he abuses the power? And that's why the Bible constantly talks about the nature of our God. It constantly affirms over and over and over again that God is good and not evil. There's no evil in him. If you read James 1, 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, our heavenly Father, who does not change like shifting shadows. God has no evil in him. There are no shadows in him. You know what a shadow is? It's like you see light, but if you look very closely, you see like a dark part hidden. There's nothing like that in God. God is all light. He's all radiance. He's all brightness. What you see is what you get. I am who I am. He doesn't have to change. He, he never changes. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Forever. That's the God we have. He's good. And that's why we always say in church that God is good all the time. We affirm that and, and all the time. God is good. Why do we have to keep saying that over and over? It's to remind ourselves. Yes, he has absolute power, but he's good. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. That's who he is, a good, good father. You know, it's interesting because the Bible tells us this good father, this good king, he set up the planet that we live in. And he put it together, beautiful planet. And then he took his authority and put it on Adam and Eve. And he says to them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, rule. He said, let's make man in our image, in our likeness. He makes a human being out of his own so sovereignty and volition. Nobody asks him to do this. And he creates a servant and then puts his, his spirit in that person and says, let them rule over the, sky, over the sea, the birds in the sea, the fish of the, the, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, over the wild animals, over everything that covers the ground. He says, let them rule. So in other words, the king has now decided, I'm colonizing this planet. And I've put my general in that planet. I've put my, my governor in that plan. That's what the Queen of England did, by the way, the King of England. He put a governor in State House. Do you know State House was actually a governor's mansion? We were ruled from there. And the governor had absolute right over the territory. So guess who the governor of the earth is? You're looking at them right now. Yeah. God says, let them rule. I'm giving them authority. They have absolute authority over this planet to represent me. Of course, human beings didn't understand the privilege they had, they started consorting with the enemy. They had conversations with God's enemy, the same one who had been kicked out of heaven. They have conversations with him. And I don't even know why he was kicked out of heaven. The Bible never tells us why. My suspicion is because the angels had a hard time understanding why God would give authority to human beings. That's my suspicion. I could be wrong because it doesn't say it. But why? You know, it's like... God has this plan. He's going to make some things out of clay. He's going to breathe on them, and then he's going to give them dominion. Wow. And they're going to become the sons of God. And you angels are going to become their ministering spirits. Ha, ha, ha. Isn't that amazing, guys? And Lucifer is like, oh, my God, no. That can't happen. 
and he goes talks to his guys it's like guys are you hearing what the big guy wants to do me if it was me what how do you guys feel well that's what guys do isn't it the people who are the rebels in the house they always go how you guys how what did you hear is it just me who's hearing yeah, yeah, even me. Yeah, yeah, actually, you're right. In fact, he makes it sound like you're the one now who's the one who's rebelling. Eh? Have you ever been in a situation of rebellion, by the way? Yeah, yeah. By the way, I don't even understand. Me, if it was me, I would, how would he say that? And they have this conversation, and a third of the angels side with Lucifer, and there's a war in heaven, and they're kicked out. Ironic thing is God kicks them out on the same planet he's going to put the human being. And you're going to see why in a little bit. You're going to understand why he puts them on that planet. Because it's a dangerous thing. Why would you put your enemy in the same planet where you're going to put this fragile human being that you're making in your image? There must be a purpose. Because God is a good father. Now the human beings, they listen to the enemy. Because he happens to be in the same space. And he comes and tells them God is not good all the time. <laughs> and all the time, God is not good. <laughs> And tells them, God actually is trying to hold out on you guys. He's trying to lie to you. He's trying to tell you that you, that, that you shouldn't eat this tree. But do you understand if you eat this tree, you'll actually be stronger and wiser than God. And he basically is enlisting them in his own rebellion. And guess what they do? They fall. They enter that rebellion. And the next thing that happens is the consequences of rebellion come upon them and upon the whole planet. Because remember who was in charge of the planet? Man. Man. So when man rebelled, the whole area he was in charge of becomes cursed. It becomes cursed because of humans. Spiritual death. If you've read Mizizi, you know these things. That we have spiritual death as human beings. We are separated. Our spirits are separated from the father of spirits. And now we live independent lives, just like Lucifer. By the way, independence is a, a great attribute, if you understand where it came from. Independence is a Luciferian trait. Yeah. Independence. In, like, think for yourself. Why should anybody ever tell you what to think? That's Lucifer completely. It was brewed in the pits of hell by Lucifer himself. That's what he tells Adam and Eve. And so we became independent beings. We became these beings that don't ever want to be led or told what to do. Spiritual separation comes in. Emotional death. The other thing that happens. What's emotional death? Emotional death is shame, hiding, low self-esteem, believing nothing good can come out of me, uh, all those things that come to psychological problems, addictions, all those psychological issues come out of this. We become broken people. The first thing Adam and Eve do is, what do they do? They hide. And that's what shame is. Shame is hiding. Shame is when you never want to know people to know. You come to church looking good, you don't want people to know you had an argument with your wife. You don't want people to know that, you, that, that where you come from doesn't look as nice. You, you never want people to see your house because you feel like they will be a sh if they found out who I really am, would they still accept me? That's shame. That's shame. I, I have these secret habits that I hide. I never want anybody to know about. That's shame. It came out of that rebellion. Uh, social death. Social death, death is betrayal in our relationships. Those of you who, are, who have come from broken families, where your father betrayed your mother or vice versa, that's where it came from. Because from that time on, Adam, uh, he, uh, Adam says of his wife, the woman you gave me. The same woman he had said, whoa, man, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. Now he's like, this woman you gave me. And until today, men are still saying, the woman you gave me. Yeah. Yeah. We're still, we're still betraying each other in our relationships. And that came out of the Garden of Eden. Any pain that some of you are feeling in marriage right now, it came out of what Adam and Eve did. Environmental death. The earth became a harsh place for humans. And humans became oppressors of the earth. Every place you go and find, people have destroyed the planet. By the way, in Kenya, we've destroyed our environment. We don't plant trees. By the way, where is Mr. B? I don't know if he's here from Shariki. He's always had a vision. I hope you haven't given up your vision to green Eastlands. Because we've talked with Mr. B, and Mr. B told me, you know the one thing about Eastlands that is different from anywhere else in this city? There are no trees in Eastlands. Wow. And that's why Eastlands is so hot. You know hell is also hot. Yeah. And that's where you have come, to, to reverse the curse. And so Mr. B says to me, I want to do a, 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 like a million trees in Eastlands. And may the Lord give you that. Yeah, he's... Now with. Because I believe we have to change. When we came to this place, this was a God-forsaken place. 
Hill City was like a representation of what hell looks like. How many of you remember that? Yeah, I mean, you'd have a service here and the, the demon winds, I used to call them demon winds, they would come into this same tent eh, with dust. Because there were no trees in the area. When the sons of God go into a place, they change that curse. And today, I mean, there are trees growing and it's going to even look more beautiful in time to come. Because God's people are here, we reverse the curse. But that's the thing that happens, environmental death and then physical death. Physical death has to do with illness. Any of you who are suffering an illness right now, you have a headache, you have a cough, you have a chronic condition. That came out of that, and death itself. So what was meant to be a place we rule, now we became ruled. All these things are ruling us. And the keys to the planet, Satan plucked them from Adam and Eve. And now Satan became the prince of the air. He ruled over the earth. But you know, the good thing is, it's not over until God says it's over. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, verse 15, God gives a clue about why he left humans in the same place as Lucifer. Because when he curses the serpent, he says, I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head as you wound his heel. Basically what he's saying is, yes, you've attacked the humans and you will keep attacking them. But guess what? The offspring of this same woman is the one who will step on your head and destroy you. And that's why when Jesus comes as the offspring of Eve, it says the Son of God appeared to destroy the, the enemy's works. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what his mission was, to destroy this work. The devil held the keys to the planet. He had rule. But Jesus, by living a virtuous life and reversing everything that Adam and Eve did. What did Jesus do? Adam and Eve, they chose independence. Jesus chose to follow. Jesus chose to follow. Even though he was in nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Remember somebody else who considered equality with God something to be grasped, even though he was not in nature God. But Jesus, even though he was in nature God, he did not consider it something to be grasped. What did he do? He made himself a servant. He humbled himself to the place where he even washed disciples' feet. He made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant. And therefore God exalted him and gave him the throne that is above every throne. Guess what happens with Jesus? He takes back the keys. Oh, come on. He takes back the keys. Come on. And then he says to the church, he says, I now give you the keys to the kingdom. He says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus came to give you back the keys. Wow. Amen. Is somebody beginning to understand yes. what's going on? This Bible is not just get saved and then you don't go to hell. Because some of us, that's what we had in CU and we got saved. But it's more than that. It's that you are a slave. You are ruled. But now your kingship has been restored over the planet. And you know what happens? He sends out the church and he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. In other words, God says, I could destroy the devil, but I'm going to leave my people. These, these ones here are the ones who are going to destroy you. And the gates, the gates of hell themselves will not prevail against these, my people. He's given us the keys. So listen to this. The ultimate role of the church is through discipleship to restore the nations of the world to their rightful ruler. Can I say it again? The ultimate role of the church is through discipleship to restore the nations of the world to their rightful ruler. The reason Mavuno Rongai exists is to restore the nations of the world, to return Rongai back to the real king. That's what you're there for. And not just Rongai, but the ends of the earth. That's what your church is there for. Now, you know, because growing up, many of us didn't know this. We thought that the gospel was about get saved, avoid hell, wait for your ticket, go to heaven. But you know, that's a half gospel. It's not what Jesus taught. Jesus' prim primary message was not salvation, but the kingdom of God. Jesus did not come to take us to heaven. He came to help us to rule the earth. So, so when you begin to understand this, things begin to change in your life. 
Because if you think Jesus came to take you to heaven, then what are you going to do? You're just going to go to work, be a good employee, make as much money as you can, uh, build a big house, build a big car, get a big car, give some money to church once in a while, come to church when you can, wait to die and go to heaven. And many Christians, that's what the kind of life they're living. But when you understand that Jesus did not come to take you to heaven, he, helped, he came to help you rule the earth. And that when he comes back, a new heaven and a new earth, it will look a little like what you know already. Because he came to help you to rule it. And that you're going to be a ruler along with him. Revelation chapter 21 is very powerful. It tells us, you know, we used to say that he shall reign forever and ever. You heard that song, Handel's Messiah. But in Revelation 21, it says, and they shall reign forever and over with him. In other words, you are created to be a king. Yeah, you're created to be a king. You're created to be a queen. This is what the church is for. The church is to help you practice kingship by taking the nations of the earth and putting them in the hands of their rightful ruler. What's the problem when we fail to understand this? What's the problem when the church fails to understand this? We begin to see all kinds of problems. You find that, you know, we start operating, we become experts in spiritual things, and we forget that we're here to rule the earth. We don't see corruption as our problem. We don't see oppression as our problem. We don't see all the things going wrong in our country, uh, 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 the gender wars, uh, people, fathers who are abandoning their children. We don't see that as our problem. We see it as someone else's problem. We're waiting for the government to come and sort their mess. When we see all the, the trash in our estate, we don't realize those are the effects of the curse. And yes, the government should be doing a better job, but, but because they're not God's people are here, that we can actually create solutions that lift the curse in the place that God has put us in. It's been said that Africa is worse today in terms of disease, crime, justice, economics, and the family than before Christianity came on this continent. In other words, our Christianity, our type of Christianity has not helped the continent. It's actually made it worse. And it's because we've not understood. Jesus did not come to preach salvation. He came to preach the kingdom of God. Yeah. When you begin to understand this, you live differently. You begin to understand, I am responsible. I am the one who imposes God's dominion. When Jesus says, he began to preach the gospel and said, the kingdom of God is now here. Oh, come on, somebody, you get a new job, and when you enter that job, the first declaration you should be making in your heart is, the kingdom of God is now here. These people have hired me. They have no idea, as they've put me here, that God's kingdom has now invaded, and there cannot be two kingdoms in one place. <laughs> come on, somebody. Because I'm here and greater is he who is within me than any other power in the world. Then I'm not here to, uh, to achieve the purpose of some multinational. I'm here to represent the kingdom that is greater than any other kingdom. And I walk with my head held high. I look and ask God, show me your agenda. Tell me why I'm here. Because I understand that the ultimate role of the church is through discipleship to restore the nations of the world to their rightful ruler. I'm here to destroy Satan's work. Yeah. By the way, Satan is very afraid of the church understanding this message. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some people who are supposed to come today and they were not able to come because he doesn't want them to understand. The reason I gave you that corporate job is that through discipleship, the nations of this world will be restored to their rightful ruler, including that company you work in. Yeah. You're a sleeper agent for a serious kingdom. Yeah, you represent. You represent something bigger than yourself. And so as we, as we talk about this, and today, today I really feel like this is a big picture that God wants us to understand. Why are we following? It's because we are part of a kingdom. We're not just individuals who happen to come to a church. This is the organizing center for the kingdom. This is where kingdom troops are trained. But you're being trained to take over the world. You can't take over the world if you don't understand the principles of the kingdom you came from. And one of the primary principles of the kingdom is that in this kingdom, we follow. Our God was a God who taught us how to follow. And he, it was so important for him that he actually became a human being and said, guys, you're not getting it. Israel, you're not getting it. Let me show you how you do it. And then he was born as a son of Mary. And he didn't come in with the thing of, guys, I know this thing. In fact, let me show you how it's supposed to have been done, guys. Uh, before, like I can teach you guys scripture. Just shut up, all of you. Let me teach you. He humbled himself. 
For 30 years, he just was a son of Mary, making wood carpentry with his father. That's all he did. Nobody even heard of him. For 30 years, he was humble. He learned. He introduced himself as the son. He was just the son of the carpenter at that point. But at 30, when God said it's time, he began the mission. Sometimes some of us, because you have so much experience, you've been in church for so long, you want to enter a place and say, this is who I am. Wow. You guys better recognize. I've been in Mavuno a long time. I've been a Christian for 30 years. I don't understand why I'm being asked to do small things. Jesus says, the Gentiles, those are the kind of conversations, those are gentle conversations. The, the kingdom of Lucifer, the Luciferian kingdom, is that kingdom where people exalt themselves. Where they show what, they want to show what they have. They want to impress people with what they have. Jesus says, not so among you. Distinguish yourself by your following. Distinguish yourself by being a servant. This is what Jesus is saying. Are you, the, the gospel is a radical document. It's a radical document. Don't just read it like baby Jesus. That's not what is there. It's a kingdom, it's, it's a kingdom overturning document. When you begin to understand this, it means that everywhere I go, by the way, everywhere I go, the kingdom of darkness is, is, is on retreat. And when I enter a new place, the kingdom of God is, of darkness is going down. It's going down because the kingdom of God is now here. And now that there's a kingdom of, there's a, there's a Mavuno church in Bujumbura, my goodness, the kingdom of God is advancing. All the darkness in Bujumbura, is, it's, on, it's on notice that we're coming. We're coming. And there cannot be two kingdoms. There cannot be the kingdom of darkness ruling in the same place as the kingdom of light. Because you guys are there, there will be a change in Bujumbura in Jesus' name. And in Burundi. And in Francophone Africa. And in the French-speaking parts of the world in Jesus' name. Yeah, there will be. By the way, I'm so excited about the French churches. Because, you know, France, France did some incredible things back in the day. Some very Luciferian things. They killed their kings, killed their bishops, and they became a completely secular nation. They had what they called the French Revolution, and they just destroyed all their leaders. And that's, it's probably one of the most secular countries in the world today. And if you go to Francophone Africa, I'm always surprised. I mean, you actually see the effects of different kingdoms. In Francophone Africa, when I, when I marry a couple, it means nothing. Yeah. Isn't that true, Pastor Mugisha? I mean, there, when you go to the AG, that's the real wedding. So before you come to church, you go to the AG, they marry you. When you come to church, the church does what it wants. But that is not even recognized by the government. That's the French world. They completely overthrew faith. Completely overthrew faith. But you know what? My goodness. The kingdom of God is now here. We're taking over. We're coming. We're bringing back. We're coming to impose the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is it's not, a, it's not a democracy. We don't choose whether we want a king or not. The king's domain is here. The planet is his. The earth is the Lord and everything in it. And so there's no choice whether it will be ruled by God or not. It is his. He made it. So this, this for me would be... I think I'll pause here. I'll pause here because I'm just thinking if I flow, you guys are going to be sitting for a while. So I want us to just... Um, I, I, I want to pray and allow an early tea break so we can come back and get deep. Tell your neighbor we're going deep. Yeah, we're going deep. We're going to talk a bit more about the implications of this kingdom. I want us to talk about the implications of this kingdom. You're going to, when, by, um, my prayer is by the time you leave here, you'll understand not just why following is important, but why it's an imperative. Why without it, you, you will not succeed as a Christian because you'll see the big picture. But before I pause, I want to just pray. Because I suspect there are some people who are here, who as I'm speaking and as you've gone through this whole four days, you've begun to understand, I call myself a Christian, but I'm a self-ruled Christian. On the throne of my life, I, as much as I say, Jesus, take the throne, I'm actually the one sitting on the throne. And it, for, it could be for different reasons. It could be that I had a bad father experience. And I've always feared somebody else being in charge of my life. What if he asked me to take, what if he asked me to quit my job? What if he asked me like the rich young ruler to give up everything? What if, what if? And for those reasons, you've kind of kept God at arm's length. Yes, you've been a Christian, maybe even a, a, a servant, but like the first prodigal. Remember we talked about the prodigal son who ran away from home. There's another prodigal who was in the house. 
and there are many Christians who are that first son. You never left. You've always been in the house. In fact, you've been very diligent in serving, but you've never understood your father's heart. You've never really served with a loyalty and a surrender to God. We say surrender, but in your mind, you're like, I surrender to a limit. There are certain things God will ask me to do that I cannot do. I sense that our father wants to have an encounter with you today. I sense that you will not leave this place the same way. I sense that you will no longer continue giving the devil root in your heart. You can't serve two masters. The Bible says that. Either you will hate one and love the other, or the other way around. You can't serve both God and yourself. You can't. You can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and your career. There has to be one leader. And I suspect that there's a Christian in the house today who needs to surrender. Maybe you've seen people and you've thought, these guys are a bit too radical. Maybe they're a bit too fanatical. And you're like, for me, I want to keep my space. I want to make sure I never get too deep in anything. I'm, I, I, I do things in moderation, including following Jesus. You know, there's those nice things of do everything in moderation, including following God. That is a Luciferian thought. And today I want to pray for that Christian who's going to say, Father, today, for the first time, I am fully surrendering everything in my life to you. You know, I remember when I was uh, an intern and that happened to me. I'd been saved for, for some years. I was even working in church. I was preaching at Nairobi Chapel on the pulpit. But I didn't understand surrender. I thought, you know what? Uh, I'm saved. I've given my life to Jesus. But I'm in charge of my life. And it's almost like I'm, 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 I wasn't doing it even rebelliously. I think I was doing it in ignorance. And I've told you this story about how we, we were asked by some missionaries to write a list of all the things that held us back and to take a day and just go and surrender. And I don't, I don't think I ever get tired of telling that story because I think it has to be the story. It's a thing. I didn't know. I thought I, I, thought I knew about following God. That's the day I came to understand. I remember thinking, I don't have anything that... I don't know, my list is social, I'm, I was 24. You know at 24 how broke you are? <laughs> Any 24 year olds in the house and below? Yeah, that's what they think about all the time, it's just how broke you are. You don't have money. Yeah, if you're looking at a 24 year old, chances are they're quite broke by the way. And, and so, so when I was asked to, to write my list of all the things, the missionaries write all the things you have and you own that, you could, that could keep you from following God and then surrender them to Him. And I remember just thinking, I'm so broke. And then they said, by the way, take the whole day to fast and pray and surrender those things in prayer. And I thought, mine, of even 20 minutes I've tried. <laughs> like the four or five things I own, 20 minutes, what am I doing praying the whole day? So I went down and I started writing those things. I started writing my list and it's like the Holy Spirit just took over. And he began to show me all the things that I thought I didn't have, but I owned, I was holding on to my life like this. He, he showed me that even my relationships were like this. I, at that time I was dating a very beautiful girl. And, and I just was like, God, I'll, I'll follow God, but this one is mine. <laughs> This one, I've already made my decision. She's mine. And I already had my plan about how I was going to get uh, marry her in a few years' time. Uh, I said, you know, I, 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 I love God, but I have to taste some money. My parents were not rich. I'm like, I have to at least ball a bit. You know, have some freedom. Anybody feel me? You know, I, I can buy a car ticket when I want to go somewhere. I don't have to ask people. You know what I'm talking about? And I was like, Lord, that one, at least money. That one, I'll serve you, but I'll even use money to give you a church. But money has to be part of my package, you know? And yeah, financial breakthrough. Come on, somebody. And, and I was like, you know, um, and, I, and I just went down that list. My identity. I mean, I, I, I had a reputation. People thought a certain way about me. And I was very conscious about how people thought of me. And I, I was like, Lord, do anything, but that one don't touch. And so it's like God started to show, show me, oh my goodness, there are so many of them. And more and more, my relationship with my, my family and the way it stood and my plans to get a master's degree in pharmacy and to, and to make a lot. It's like God was just showing me all these things. And I was writing them and writing them and writing them. And then I began to pray about them. And I chose to separate them with the least, the easiest to get rid of to the hardest. And I started the prayers. And as I was praying, I started to cry because it's painful. It's painful. 
to surrender. It's painful to surrender. Kingdom takeover is not a pretty thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When kingdoms take over, it's not an easy thing. What happened is I was a Christian, but I was not a subject of the kingdom. Yeah? I was a Christian by affiliation. But God wants dominion. And so I started giving away those things. And I actually was crying. I remember seeing tears on that paper as I, one after the other, very painfully, things, I was just like, okay, God, just take that one. And I don't even know how I stayed. In my natural mind, I would have run at some point. But I just kept giving up things over and over. And I got to the last thing. And as I just said, God, take it. I was like, Lord, if you take away my girlfriend and you make me single the rest of my life like a Catholic priest. It was, it was painful, by the way. It was very painful. Uh, Lord, if you take away money, so I'll be broke the whole of my life. Oh, God. Take. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, it was hard. And as I was giving away the last thing, there's that cut up on your shoulder. Where are you? We have been looking for you. Why are you looking for me? It's six o'clock. The day is over. It's time for dinner. And the whole day had gone by as I was surrendering. And I keep telling people, the day I left that room, I left with such an amazing lightness. I was the brokest person in the world. You know, when you give away, you have nothing left. Even my own life I'd given away. So I was like, Lord, if I die tomorrow, it is okay. It is okay. Do you know what happened? I was the brokest person in the world, but I had the most security I'd ever felt in my whole life. That's the day I lost fear of dying. I don't fear dying. <laughs> I don't. Because for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. It is better for you that I remain in this season, by the way. And I'm fully convinced of that. But should the Lord choose to take me away, there are sons over here who will continue this work. Yeah. I don't hold Mavuno like this. It's not even, by the way, my role in Mavuno is not important. Even if the Lord told me tomorrow, leave and pass on to Pastor James and let him take over, I'll be the first one. In fact, I'll be Pastor James. Let me pray for you. Yeah, because I'm a kingdom resource. This is not, this is not mine. This is a kingdom's. And I'm a kingdom resource as well. That's, that's the thing that happened. I just, I live life like this. Everything I own now belongs to God. But you know what happened? I had such security. I lost my fear of death. I lost my fear of brokenness. I don't fear being broke, by the way. <laughs> that's a radical thing to say, isn't it? Like, I don't fear. That's why I don't live for money. But you know what Matthew 6, 33 says, which is a weird thing? That as you seek God's kingdom, what happens? Things start following you. They start to follow you. Can I give you an incomplete testimony? It's not complete. I don't know how it's going to end because I live like this. So when we started the fast, God gave Pastor Kara and I an amount to give for the fast fruits. Usually I don't give my fast fruit. I prayed and asked God, what do you want me to give? And usually it's a lot more than, my, <laughs> than our combined income. So God gave us the number. We pledged it. And do you know, I think it was just a couple of days after that pledge, Somebody called us and offered us a piece of land that I have no amount. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculously priced piece of land. I know the value of that piece of land. It's, it's maybe a third of the price. And he offered it to us. I don't have the money, by the way. But he actually, it was so crazy. This guy, and I'd asked him for it maybe 10 years ago. He showed up with a title deed. And he said, Pastor, I want you to buy this piece of land. And what do you think it's worth? And he told me how much he wanted it for me to buy it. And I said, <laughs> I can't afford that. He said, how much do you want to pay? And we told him. And he said, here's a title deed. Pay me. And he went. So right now I'm holding the title deed. I don't have the money, but I actually have the title. Are you understanding how God works? Me, I'm seeking God's kingdom. I'm writing my pledge. I'm fasting. And then the guy came to interrupt me. In other words, it was even an interruption for me. Like, why are you chasing me? Like, I don't, I'm not looking for it. There's a place you get to in God's kingdom where things look for you. You don't look for them. And those who are close to us know that that has been our story. We don't amass. We don't look for it. It looks for us. You know what? This is the beautiful thing about surrender. If you've ever struggled and said, God, I can't give up my job for you. 
I'm telling you, you're like that child that Pastor James was talking about, that you're holding on to those potatoes, not understanding that there's something called chocolate, that your father wants you to taste, that is a lot tastier than those potatoes you're holding on to. God has something. God's gifts for you, God's plans for you are far greater than your gifts to yourself, your plans for yourself. And many of you are about to discover that as you enter this journey of surrender. Uh, when you surrender, you say, God, take me wherever. I'm going to serve you. All of mine, all that I have, all that I am, all that I hope to be, I surrender it to you. I no longer am going to live for myself. I'm going to be a person on assignment. I'm here on earth to fulfill just one purpose. I will not let fear stop me from anything. I will lead with a yes. That's how I lead, by the way. When God says do it, I do it afraid many times, but I never do it with a no. My first response is, yes, Lord. And then I figure out how I'm going to do it. And you know what? God has opened doors for me that are incredible. And for my wife, as we've lived this way. I want to usher somebody into that lifestyle today. I really feel the Lord wants me to do that. A lifestyle of surrender. And uh, before I pray for you, by the way, I, there are people like that in the house, I'm hoping. Uh, the Lord has told me there are many of us who are living, you know, one life in the kingdom, one life in my career. Uh, one life in the kingdom, one life in my fears. I'm not fully surrendered to Jesus, but I sense that today God wants to make a difference because these are the people he's going to take over the planet with. Number two, as you're considering that, there's somebody here who has not given your life to Jesus. Maybe you are not here when we made the first altar call, or maybe you've been here, but it's not something that you've considered. It's just not the thing for now. Or maybe you're walking a life where you know you're not fully surrendered to Jesus. Uh, you gave your life to Jesus a long time ago, and then you, you fell away. And right now, to be honest, you're living a backslidden Christian life. You know you don't pray, you don't look for Him, you don't seek Him. Uh, you live sort of like a life, but you know it's by God's grace you're here. You're not even supposed to be here, but you somehow showed up in this place. And today I want to challenge you to give your life to Jesus. This kingdom, this salvation, it was not the message of Jesus, but it's the entrance into the kingdom. That's why He said you must be born again. Because when you're born again, then spirit gives birth to spirit. What happens is, as you're walking alive, ar around, your body is alive, but your spirit is dead. And when you give your life to Jesus, guess what happens? Your spirit becomes joined with Jesus' spirit, and He gives birth to your spirit. You start to have a spiritual experience. You start to understand things of the spirit. You're able to say no to the, work, the works of darkness, and you're able to say yes to the things of God. You can't appreciate anything we've talked about these last four days if you're not connected through your spirit to the spirit of God. And so I want to just give somebody an opportunity for that. Uh, Pastor James already asked, but I just sense in my spirit there may be one or two people still who you have not given your life to Jesus. And I'd love to start by praying for you before I pray for those who are going to surrender. So let me just ask if you're here, just put up your hand. You're, you're one of those who's saying, Pastor M, you know what? I know that I need to give my life to Jesus. I know I'm not living a godly life right now. I'm living a backslidden Christian life. I'm pro professing to be a Christian, but my life out there is completely different. I know I need to recommit my life to Jesus. Whichever one of those categories you're in, just put up your hand and then put it down again. I'd love to pray with you. Just put it up real high if you're here. Thank you, my brother. I see that hand. Anybody else who's here? Anybody else? Just join him. I see another brother at the back. To God be the glory. Come on, Mavuno. Let's appreciate them. I see another one at the back. God be the glory for you. Wow. Wow. I see somebody in this side as well. To God be the glory. Wow. Amen. I think every area here is represented. Anybody else? Just put up your hand and would love to pray with you. Anybody who's missing? Yes. I thank God for you. Don't be left behind. I see you at the back. To God be the glory. I see you as well. Oh my goodness, there's so many of them. I see you in the middle there. Thank you so much. You can put it down again. Anybody else? I don't want to leave you behind. Just put it up and put it down again. There are so many people. And these people are not saying, I want, they're not responding in hype. Yes, thank you so much. I see you as well. They're responding to their Father in heaven. And they're saying, I want to be part of this kingdom. I want to be part of this big thing you're doing in my generation. I don't want to live my life for myself and be part of a different kingdom to miss out on why I was created. And I bless God for every one of you. Anybody else before I pray for those ones? Just put it up. I mean, don't, it's, not, it's not about this pastor. It's not even about Mavuno Church. It's about you and your father and what he created you for. Understanding the purpose of your life. Anybody else? Just put it up. I just sense there might be somebody who's really struggling with this conversation. Yes, I see you, my brother. To God be the glory for you. Thank you so much. The Holy Spirit is in the house today. 
He's in the house and he's saving. I'm going to invite every one of you to do a bold thing. I'm going to just tell you, take a step up. If you've raised your hand, come up to the front. I want to make it my privilege to pray for you. So come up right now. Come up right now. As your pastor, I will pray for you and lead you in this prayer. Let's appreciate them as they come. Just run, 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 run. Come to the front. Wow, 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 wow. Wherever you are, just come, 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 come. Don't be shy. Don't let the devil hold you back from your destiny. If you're sitting next to somebody who put up their hand, you can, you can encourage them as they come up. Come, 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 come. Wow, 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 wow. Thank God for all these brothers and sisters. We bless God for you. We thank God for you. We're so happy that you're here. You know what? It's such a beautiful thing. When God calls sons and daughters to himself. And you know, the theme of this retreat, we say, I mean, it, it wasn't our theme. We had a theme. Me, my theme is following hard. But at the beginning of this retreat, God put a, another theme there, which is the sons being restored. And these are sons and daughters who are being restored right now. And I bless God for you. Amen. Amen. By the way, if you're still there and you're still sitting and you're still hesitant, don't be hesitant. Come on, you can join these ones. Be man enough, be woman enough, and just take your life in your hands and put it where it belongs. Uh, don't be shy about that. Let me ask the pastors if you just stand behind them uh, because we want to pray for them and welcome them into the family. Bless God. Wow. Yes, come, come, come. Praise God for you. Amen. 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 Wow. Mavuno, when you become, when you, if you could only see, if your eyes, your spiritual eyes could be opened, you'd not be just clapping, you'd be dancing right now. You'd be giving a big shout to heaven right now because of what is about to happen. Something amazing is transpiring in the spiritual world right now because of the decisions that are being made right now by these young people, by the, every one of these people who's making this decision. I just want to say, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. You know, going to church can't make you a follower of Jesus. Having Christian parents can't make you a follower of Jesus. Growing up in a pastor's home can't make you a follower of Jesus. God has no grandchildren. You have to make your own decision to follow him. But when you do, the Bible says he gives you the right to become a son of God, a daughter of God. And as you make that decision, this is what he's calling you into, into a relationship now, not through your parents, but directly to you. That each of you now will have a relationship with your father. He's going to change you greatly. In fact, I want to predict that you will not recognize yourself. By the end of this year, you'll be such a different person. People will even look at you and even wonder, who is this? Because God will have done such a lot in your life. And I want to say that all some of, some of those things that have been limiting you, God is about to just remove them from your life. You're about to experience the love of a father. You're not going to be an orphan spiritually anymore. You're about to experience your father's love. And so I'm so happy as I lead you in this prayer. Amen. Let me just ask you if you just put out your hands like this. And when you're putting your hands out, you're, this is a gesture of surrender. You're saying, I'm not going to lead myself anymore. I'm going to trust God to lead me. I've got a new boss. My life is under control of somebody else. So if you're going to say these words, I want you to say these words after me loudly. And I'm going to ask everybody who's ever said these words to join them as they say them. Amen. Let's say them. Dear Jesus, I come to you to give you my life. From today, I choose to follow you. Forgive my sins. Remove them from me. Come into my life through your Holy Spirit. Fill me and help me to follow you. I want to love you I want to understand you as my father. So Holy Spirit, be my teacher. From this day forward, I am saved and I am yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Let me just ask our pastors if you could just give them a hug, give them a high five, give them a greeting, shake their hand, welcome them to the family. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, is it Pastor Maina? Who's, who's in charge here? Pastor Maish, if you could just grab a few of the pastors. And let, let me just ask that you would follow our leaders there. They'll take you to the back room just for a minute for a prayer. 
and just pray with you. Take your contacts. We'd love to just see how we can connect you with your campuses and help you grow. Can we appreciate them as they go? Woo! Amen. Amen. Wow. Our God is so great. You know, I have come to love, it, like God is amazing. Like, I would never have come to a meeting like this when I was not saved. So I never, I never used to do altar calls in these meetings, but I've come to understand that God always has an agenda. He always has an agenda. And by the way, as I make this next prayer, it's just as important. The devil wants you to remain a mediocre Christian. But I've come to understand, Jesus said some very tough words. He said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord is my follower. And I've come to understand, he says, only the one who does the will of my Father, the one who surrenders completely to God, that's the one who is my follower. He even says some harsh things to his own family. He said, when, when he said, your mother and brother are waiting outside, he said, my brother and mother are the ones who do the will of God. So it's very easy to be a Christian, but not to be doing God's will, because you're living a self-directed life. And I sense that today, God is also calling firstborn sons home. Those were the ones who are the prodigals, but he's calling the firstborns back home. The ones who've been living a Christian life, but not a surrendered life. And if you're there, I'm going to ask you to do a very bold thing. Just stand up where you are. Just stand up where you are. Uh, praise God. Look at all these sons and daughters. Look at all these sons and daughters. Praise God for you. Praise God for you. I thank God for you. Yes, let's appreciate everybody who's standing up. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Oh my goodness, Lord, this is what you are about. This is what the Lord was telling me. He was telling me there's something that has to happen before I start to move. This is it. He said, even among your army, there are many who are living for themselves. And you need, I, I need to do something first in their lives. And so, Father, thank you for revealing that to me. Thank you for your sons and daughters who are standing up. Thank you because, Lord, something radical is about to happen in this place. Even as your sons and daughters make this prayer. I'm going to ask you to just put out your hands in surrender as well, wherever you're standing. And just speak to your father. Just tell him that thing that you know. Tell him that thing that you know. Those things that you've held to yourself. Those things that you've said, Lord, I will serve you but this. Lord, I will follow except this. And maybe there are even things God has told you to do and you've said, I don't have the qualifications. I don't have the time. Let me do them later. Just say, Lord, I, I choose today. From today, I will follow 100%. Kayende, kayende, as Pastor Kilonzi would say. Just say, God, I, I give it to you. Take my life. Take everything. My ambitions, my dreams, my fears. Take them, Lord. Take them. They're yours. They're yours. Father God, thank you for these, your sons and daughters. You're receiving their prayers right now. You're hearing them as they call out. Father God, fear is about to be abandoned and diminished and thrown out of this room in Jesus' name. Father God, thank you because the kingdom of God is now here. It is advancing forcefully in the lives of your people. Thank you that you're raising your army of surrendered soldiers, of people who are ready to follow hard after the King of Kings. I bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Receive the surrender of your children. Receive the surrender of your children. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him Make this your prayer. I will ever love and trust in His presence. In His presence. Daily live. Daily live. I surrender. I surrender all. Lord, it's you we are speaking to. I surrender oh, 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 to you, my blessed Savior. My blessed I surrender all. Savior, I surrender all. Upon your confession, a spiritual transaction has just taken place. The kingdom of heaven is now here and your life fully belongs to God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. 
you no longer live but it is Christ who lives in you and this life you're going to live from now on going forward you will live fully surrendered your career belongs to God your car belongs to God your house belongs to God every decision now becomes your father's decision because it's his possessions now that you're responsible over you're moving from an owner to a steward you're moving from the driver's seat to the co-driver's seat from now on you have a, a ruler a master a king who is in your house your marriage belongs to him those of you who are married your children belong to the king those of you who have children your career belongs to the king those of you who are in careers your business belongs to the king those of you who run business and I charge you going forward to actually write this commitment down after today in fact do it sometime today write down that commitment and say Lord from today I turn over control of everything that I was holding back to I turn it over to the Lord God sign that statement and date it and keep it somewhere safe and Lord the world has yet to see what God can do through a people that are fully yielded to you and Lord right now we are saying we're ready this ground is ready Holy Spirit we're ready for you to come and do your thing and Father God, I know that through this day, you're going to do it. That there's some deliverance that is going to come in this place. There's healing that is going to quickly appear in this house. The things that were holding your presence back, now Lord, you know, you can see. Come and do it. Come and do it, Lord. And Father God, I just wait on you. We're waiting on you, Holy Spirit. This whole day, we're waiting on you. And we can't wait to see what you're going to do. I bless you, Lord, because you're a good Father. And we're coming back to our good Father. And these things we pray, believing and trusting in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give glory to our good Father. Woo! Let's stand up together. Let's all stand to our feet. Amen. So we're going to go for our tea break. And I don't know if our MCs want to brief us on that. Is that okay? And then we'll come back and we're going deeper. Tell your neighbor we're going deeper. Come on, somebody. Amen.